So as the kids venture out, would you turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Lord, there's always abundantly more because you are who you are. It's not because I've earned or deserve any of it. Lord, you're the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. You're the Alpha and Omega, Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, Coming King, Jesus, name above all other names. Every name will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I pray this morning that we would be people who surrender. We sing songs about wanting to be about or be in your presence. And Lord, I pray that we become people who are intentional about putting ourselves in a position for your Holy Spirit to do what your Holy Spirit does, and that's change us from the inside out, that you be glorified. Lord, I pray, uh, if there's anyone in this room, or with an earshot that doesn't know you, that needs to come to you, or return to you, that you would call, and we'd repent, that you would enable us to come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray for those of us, Lord, you know the details and the needs, that are battling something fierce. I'm assuming... <laughs> That we're all battling. Some come in victory. Some come in freedom. Some just barely got here. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a way that's unmistakably you. Lord, healing power is not of me or us. It's of you. And so, Lord, as an act of mercy, as an act of grace, as an act of love, that you would continue to do the work that your word would go forth. It's amazing. Lord, that the resurrection power, the same power that conquered the grave that lives in me. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are willing to receive. Not my words, they mean nothing. But your word. That you be glorified. In Jesus' name. 1 Samuel chapter 15. When I entered into an agreement with the Metropolitan District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance to become the transitional pastor, there were two requirements and one recommendation. And I mentioned before that the two requirements were, number one, to complete the ordination process, which I was already pursuing. The second requirement was to be involved in the coaching process, which meant that I would allow um, leadership from the district to come alongside of me during this transition. And I was already pursuing both of those, so it was very easy for me to enter into that agreement. The recommendation that they gave wasn't simply a recommendation for me. It was more than a recommendation for me and the elders. It was a recommendation for every person that is involved in the body of the Lighthouse Church. And that recommendation was that the Lighthouse Church be involved in an assessment evaluation called the Peak Profile. As they were speaking these words, I and the elders jumped on top of it and said, we're in! to being evaluated as far as where we are as a body. I am no stranger to the evaluation process. While I've never been a part of the peak profile evaluation, when I worked at Youth Advocate Programs, I was evaluated as an employee on a yearly basis. The regional director who I had a relationship with, who was my direct supervisor, uh, once a year, I would get a document several pages long. I was required to complete that document 
everything about our services, the finances, my personal growth. I would send it to him. A few weeks later, we would get together and dialogue about it. When it came to the evaluation process, I was on both sides of the chair because part of my role and responsibilities was to evaluate those that were providing the services in the areas that I was serving. I saw the evaluation time, and I still do, as a way to build up those that are doing the work as well as challenge us to take it to the next level. And so I'm a fan of assessment and evaluation. But why would a church need to go through an assessment or evaluation process? Because the call from God on the church is a big deal. There are eternal ramifications to what this body is being about. How do you know what the direction of a church should look like? How do you know the ways to achieve and move about to achieve that direction? How do you know this peak profile? I'm not going to give you all the details today, but the idea is that probably September-ish, some members of the Metropolitan District will come down and meet with the church staff and elders. And they will give us more detail about what this profile looks like. After that, there will be a three-week window where everybody involved in the Lighthouse Ministries, everybody, will have access to a questionnaire that you can complete. It's primarily online, but if you say, I have no access, or I'm not an online person, we will give you a paper copy. So it will be available to everyone. They're hoping that at least 30% of the people complete it. I'm hoping at least 75% of the people want to have a word into their experience and their belief about what Scripture says the church should look like. After the survey is complete, they will compile the information and they will be able to determine where we are in development, where we're strong and where we need strengthening in these areas. The areas of spiritual leadership, personal growth, mission focus, loving community, worship gathering, vision alignment, alliance partnership, financial stewardship, effective organization, and growing community. Then they'll determine what action steps, where do we need to move to strengthen areas that might need to be strengthened. Jeff mentioned an interesting word just a few minutes ago. He used two words. He said, core values. Every family has core values. They may not be spoken. They may not be written on a refrigerator. But every family has core values. And these core values drive us in the day-to-day. -day. If you lived in my house for a month, you would walk, you'd walk away with a lot. But if I said, what do you think after living with us? And the reason, I wouldn't say just come and visit. You'd have to live with us for at least a month to determine what our core values are. And I said, when you leave, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. List a few things that you would consider core values. A few of those that I think you'd be able to write down is that family matters. That we are intentional about spending time with one another. I believe you would also say that communication matters. That we foster an environment where people can speak. I believe they may disagree, but of all of us in our home, I speak the, less, the least. But when I do speak, I ask questions because I want to foster an environment where you can communicate what you think and what you feel. 
But I also believe when you walked away that you would also indicate that one of our core values is that prayer matters. Core values are not just things that you do when things are going well. Core values emanate in and through in the good and the not so good. What are the core values of this church? Because they should be spoken. Do you, if you're a member or a regular attender of this ministry, know what the core values of the Lighthouse Church are? They're on the website. But you shouldn't need a website to know what the core values are. We're part of a bigger entity called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Do you, and you should if you're a member or regular attender, know what the core values of the Christian and Missionary Alliance are? And I believe their core values and our core values are the same values of the one who really we need to take some learning from of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the core values of the Savior were, are? Because the core values of the Christian and Missionary Alliance and the core values of the Lighthouse Church, I believe, are the very core values of Jesus Christ. And so over the next several weeks that you see me, we're going to be looking at one core value at a time. Because how do we determine the call of God if we don't know the core values of the Savior himself? And I'm going to begin today with the core value that God's word is indispensable. That God's word is absolutely necessary in everything we do as a believer and as a body at the Lighthouse Church. And if it's not, we have simply become an organization. There is an article that I referenced years ago. There is an article written by GQ magazine. This article was written about, the idea was there's 21 books that you and I as Americans might be considered classic reads. Catcher in the Rye, Adventures of Huck Finn, The Lord of the Rings. These are classics. GQ magazine says we're going to refute that. That these books that you consider classics, not really that good. Of those 21 books, you know what book was on their list? The Bible. Overrated, they said. This is exactly what they said. I care what they said because there's some truth in it. The Holy Bible is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but in actuality have never read it. Those who have read it know that there are some good parts, but overall, it is certainly not the finest thing that man has ever produced. It is repetitive, self-contradictory, foolish, and even ill-tempered. I can respond to this, what this man says, because I know this man. <laughs> One of the things about this article that's striking to me is that it's inaccurate. I'm curious if anyone read the Bible before they critiqued it. Even if they didn't understand it. I don't expect an unbeliever to understand the Bible. But even if you read the Bible, the Bible claims man didn't write the Bible. The Bible was authored by the living God. The word of God is called inspired. That it has been God breathed by human authors. So if somebody actually read the Bible to critique it in an article, you think they would have gathered enough information to know that man didn't write this book. It is amazing, though, that God used 40 authors on three different continents in three different languages over 12 to 1,500 years to write this book. It is almost unbelievable the consistency of it from the beginning to the end. But what is striking to me and why I read this article is because I believe there is something true about it. 
The Holy Bible is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but in actuality have never read it. And so my question to you today is not, do you read the Bible? My question today is, do you have a relationship with God's Word? What we're going to do for a few moments this morning is look at four portions of Scripture where you're going to see people's response to the Word of Lord, the Word of the Lord, and it's an indication of what their relationship is like with the Word of the Lord. And we're beginning in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 15. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul, the first anointed king of Israel. Can you imagine being a king? But even the king of God's chosen people. We know that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. We know that they cried out to God and God called out Moses and Aaron, the human leaders, that God would move in, through, and around, that God would free them from slavery, bring them down a road into the promised land. We know that Moses and Aaron did not lead them into the promised land because of their sin, that God called on Joshua to lead the way. God would move in, through, and around, that God would move them in, and they would conquer, almost, the promised land. We know that after the death of Joshua, there was a period of time called the period of judges, in which God ruled, so to speak, through those judges. And during the time of Samuel, the people cried out to God and they said, we want a king. Essentially what they were saying is, you're not enough. We need a human to lead us. Someone with flesh. God is just, and he acquiesces. He says, I'll give you a king. But he warns them. You want a king, you're getting a king. But there's going to be ramifications to that, having a human leading the way. Saul, the first king of Israel, has been given a mission by God. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. The Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them. It tell him 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and sent an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag the, and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But when... But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his honor. And he has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached out, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, 
The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people. The Amalekites make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better to sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. No, I beg you, forgive my sin and now come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to them, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn your kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back to Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him confidently, thinking surely the bitterness of death has passed. But Samuel says, as, a, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he made Saul king over Israel. What do you do with that? Do you think the punishment fits the crime? Fascinating story. The mission, don't you think the mission was clear? Destroy everyone and everything. I'm fascinated by the interaction between Samuel and Saul. Because as they greet, Saul says, I've done it. I've completed the mission. Do you think he really understood that he didn't complete the mission? And then he starts to rationalize. Well, we saved the cattle, the best, because we were going to sacrifice it. I love the word he says to your God. Then he says, well, the soldiers. I was afraid of them, and they wanted to save the best of what was. So I gave in to them. Don't you think the guilt is the same? Whether he knew what was going on or didn't know what was going on, he's still guilty. But I think it's bigger than that. I think it's an issue of pride. That's why I say, my my words fall to the ground and God's words go forth because I wasn't there. And I don't know the heart of a man, but God does. And that's why the consequence was so significant. That he took matters into his own hands. Why do I think it's pride? Because number one, he's in a place building a monument in his own honor. Who does that? And when Samuel confronts him, he says, remember when you were here in your own mind? Remember when you were hiding in the luggage 
when we were trying to find you to anoint you king? And now look at you. There have been people over the years that have said to me, Gary, God has given us a brain when trying to determine what this book is and what the call is on our life. I don't believe God gave us a brain so that we should decipher what part of the call we follow. I think there are times that we live in an American culture where this meism that it's about me has seeped its way in, and I think that's what happened here with Saul, that I'll decide. It's really an issue with authority. It's an issue that when God calls us, our response is to answer the call completely as he indicated. Over the past few weeks or months, people have asked me a question. They said, Gary, do you really want to be the leader, the head pastor at the Lighthouse Church? A lot of times, how we talk indicates really what we believe or know about this word. That question, I appreciate you asking, but it's not valid. This isn't about what I want. This is about what I'm called to. Where in the Bible, and I don't compare myself to anybody in the Bible, where in the Bible did God ask people, do you want? When God needed an ark built, did he go to Noah and say, hey, I need an ark, are you in? He said, I need you to build an ark. When God called on Abraham to go, did he ask him if he wanted to go? When Esther put her life or was put in a position where her life was on the line, did God ask her beforehand if she wanted to be in that situation? When Jesus asked people or called on people to follow him, was that a question? Was there a question involved with that? He said, come and follow me. You see, our culture thinks that we have a sort of, that it's our job to determine what God's call is on our life. It's the same thing with spiritual gifts. I believe if you have a relationship with God, he has given you A or gifts. And those gifts are probably not things, a lot of people think, well, those are things I'm naturally good at. The gifts are a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that the body be built up, that he'd be glorified. Either a moment in time or a lifetime. He doesn't lay out those gifts and say, come on up, pick what you want. He gives you what he wants to give you and expects that gift to be fleshed out. It's not our job to determine that. He's the king of all kings. And he calls us to a mission. And that's to obey the word of the Lord. And if we don't, The reality is, we're rejecting him. Nehemiah chapter 8 is a portion of scripture in Israel's history where they were rebellious. God sent an Aryan nation called the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine what it must have been like to live during these times? The Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar came and wreaked havoc, killed people, totally destroyed. Imagine an area, imagine another state coming down and just killing people, wreaking and destroying our homes and our churches. And then if that isn't enough, they take caravans of people back to Babylonia, back to their area where they're living in captivity for 70 years. All a consequence of their disobedience. At the back end, after these 70 years are over, these people are allowed to go back. And they're allowed to go back to Jerusalem and their area to rebuild. And there are groups of people that go back. And Nehemiah, an amazing story, a man who was a cupbearer to the king, a man living in captivity, hears about the walls that are in ruin. And it grieves him, not just that the walls are in ruin, but it grieves him that the sin that was committed that was a result of the walls being in ruin. The king allows him to go back. And over a period of time and through opposition, 
Those walls are rebuilt. They are rebuilt in 52 days. Remarkable, even if you were living in these times. And this is what happens after the walls are rebuilt. There's a lot of names here, which I am going to butcher. So patience, please. Nehemiah chapter 8. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkah, Messiah, and on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malachi, Hashem, Hashpadaniah, Zechariah, and Mezulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above him. As he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodai, Messiah, Kelta, Azura, Josbadad, Hanan, and Pella instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that they could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the Lord. Then Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understand the words that have been made known to them. You want to talk about a relationship? These people had a relationship with the Word of God. It's clear in their response. From daybreak till noon. We want to be in and out in an hour. From daybreak to noon, they listened attentively. The word amen simply means, I agree. So be it. When the word was open, can you imagine a group of people having so much reverence for the word of God that when it was opened, nobody told them, they all stood up. As an understanding that these aren't just words. This is the word of the living God. And I believe they responded that way because these words were realized in and through. These people saw that the word of God was trustworthy and true, even in destruction and consequences. But they were also realizing that this wasn't just a time of consequences, that this was a time of deliverance, that God was redeeming his people. This wasn't just about building the walls of Jerusalem. This was about spiritual revival. And they weeped because of their sin. When is the last time you and I opened the word of God and it brought us to a point where we wept? An understanding of our sin that was so egregious that God had to send Jesus to redeem us. These people had a relationship with the word. John chapter 8. A portion of scripture where there's this sort of, it's amazing, Jesus is debating 
with the Pharisees. I don't know if it's debating or arguing. I know people, oh, Jesus, well, you know what? I mean, there's an intensity here. As they're trying, can you imagine seeing Jesus and trying to figure out who he is, what he's saying, what it means? <clears throat> Luke, uh, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. And in your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area uh, near the place where the offerings were put, yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that, the way, is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you didn't, do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I'm claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. And what I have heard from him, I will tell the world. They did not understand what he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me, and he has nothing left alone. He has, he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth <clears throat> will set you free. Do you believe that? That the truth will set you free? A lot of times I hear that. We only reference part of that verse. The truth will set you free. <clears throat> There's another part of that verse. If you back up, Jesus said, if, if you hold to my teaching, if you grab on to my word, if, not simply hearing the truth, if you hold on to my teaching, that will be a reflection that you are my disciple. Then you will know the tr truth. The Greek word for truth means to have a relationship with. Then you will have a relationship with this truth. Then you will be set free. Not just hearing the truth, having a relationship. Jesus wasn't speaking simply the words of God. He was and is the word of God. Do you have a relationship with the truth? If the Bible was removed from you today, where you had no more access to it, would it matter to you at all? Do you know that today there are 52 countries where it's illegal or extremely dangerous to have this book? Those people put their lives on the line. Some of them hold it to a different value than we do. I had a friend of mine, I'm telling you what he said. Matt, Matt and I went to high school together, believer. We also went to Youth for Christ where Rudy was leading, Rudy and Terry were leading the way. He went on to a call to be involved in full-time ministry as a youth pastor. And I don't remember, this was in the 90s, this is pre-phone. He went to a church to be interviewed. I don't know if it was a pastor or a youth pastor. And after he got back from this interview, he said, Gary, you know what I did? He said, my wife and I 
we sat, we went to the church. We were, we were going to go to the church where he was being interviewed. And on a Sunday morning, he said, we, we got to the church very early. And we parked our car. And we sat, we watched all the people walk in. And he said, here's what I was looking at. He said, I was curious if those people were bringing their Bibles or not. Not as a legalistic sort of, but he, in his mind, he could determine if God's word was a core value to them or not. I don't, listen, I'm not looking to see, <laughs> I got other things on my mind. I'm not looking to see if you're bringing your word. We have phones, so you can, why wouldn't you? You should never trust anything that comes out of this mouth or that's up on that screen. How much value does the word of God have in your life? Do you have a relationship to the point where it's bringing you freedom? Finally, in Amos. And listen, I don't care if you're within earshot of me and you can read, open the Bible. Amos, chapter 5. God, as an act of love, sent prophet after prophet after prophet to warn his people. During this time in the northern keep in the northern kingdom, people were living large. Things looked good on the outside. They were participating in worship times. But what appeared to be going on and what was really going on in their heart was a reflection in what was going on in the society around them. And God is giving them a warning here to repent. And in Amos chapter 8, verse 1, this is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. A basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, the songs of the temple will be turning into wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell again and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling them, a sweep, selling them sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything you have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile and it will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feast in the morning and your singing into weeping. I will make all you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for only a... For for an only son, and the end of it like a bitter day. Their days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. It's freedom or famine. Which do you want? There are people that walk around me that are spiritually starving. And I say, here, take this. Jesus is the answer. And they'll crawl away, barely claw, take the book. And they say, I want something tangible. It's the word of the living God. It's living water. Here's the issue. Bottom line. Are we desperate enough? It's all about, we use the word surrender. We as Americans don't surrender until we're desperate. 18, 19 years ago, I was desperate. I wasn't, I didn't have, was I a believer? Yes. I don't believe that at that time I had a relationship with his word. I got to a point in my life as a husband, as a father, as a brother, where I couldn't do what God was calling me to do. And I was desperate. And at that point, I said, I am going to spend, at a minimum, an hour a day with the living God. And it begins with reading his word, spending time in word and song, and I never looked back. 
We as people, the God's word is indispensable. But until you're desperate, until you're willing to surrender, and I know people say, Gary, you don't understand. I've never been taught how to read the word of God. I didn't either, but I was desperate. And I had nowhere else to go. People say, Gary, you don't understand. I don't have the time. Some may say, you might be thinking this, well, you're a pastor, so you've got sort of, you, that's what you do. No, no, no. Before I was a pastor, I began a relationship with the word of the Lord. People say, I don't have time. I was living up north, two little ones, working full time, a 90-mile round-trip commute, full-time job, church plant pastor, I was desperate. So you know what I did? I got up early and I made time. It's called a sacrifice. It's called being desperate to the point where I said, God, I surrender. Can you imagine what these celebrations would be like if all of us were engaged in spending time in his word every day? It's one or the other. I don't say this in judgment at all. God says this as an act of love. I sent Jesus to die so that you can have freedom. That freedom comes from the truth. And I guarantee you that truth will set you free. <laughs> but you got to enter in. Lord, I pray that my words would fall to the ground and your word would go forth. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is without limit. Your very Holy Spirit, I can't understand this word, but your Holy Spirit enables us. So Lord, let this idea of I don't understand it, Lord, I pray that we would be people who get rid of the excuses for why we're not, and be people who grow in our understanding of what you did for us as an act of love, so that we might enter into a relationship with you, so that this might become something we do naturally, that we might get excited about, that we have access to the king of all kings, that we are your children and you call us by name. Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name.